Welcome to MSL Presents A Question of Law. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and is shown nationwide. In several states, the legality of single gender classrooms, health clubs, and social clubs has been challenged with differing outcomes based on local state law. There is also a growing movement in support of the return to schools solely for women or men. Query. Are times so different, or are we so desperate, that a return to segregation by the sexes and separate facilities is now the answer? On the other hand, is separate but equal always a bad thing? Joining me at our town meeting on separate but equal educational facilities are Pam Collins, the Massachusetts president of the American Association of University Women. Welcome, Pam. Thanks for joining us. Gretchen Van Ness, attorney for Mary Daly the Boston College professor who is involved in a dispute with her employer concerning her teaching of women-only classes. Thanks for joining us. We're delighted to have you here. Attorney Constance Rudnick, a professor at the Massachusetts School of Law, where she teaches, among other things, constitutional law. The co-host for today's show is Michael L. Coyne, the Associate Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. And I am Diane Sullivan, a professor at MSL. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Connie, let's begin with where the Supreme Court stands on the issue of separate but equal with respect to educational facilities. The most recent statement was the 1996 case involving Virginia Military Institute. Um, and in that case, the Supreme Court indicated that because the separate facility which the state of Virginia had um, proposed as an alternative to uh, requiring admission of women to the Virginia Military uh, Institute, um, the Young Women's Leadership School at Mary Baldwin College, um, was not sub either sub substantively or substantively um, uh, equal or substantially equal um, to the educational um, offering and, and education in a variety, not just the classes, but the facilities and and uh, the faculty and the uh, history of the school because they were not substantially comparable. Um, the court ruled that uh, Virginia had to admit women to that institution. Uh, indicates to me that if um, a state or locality could demonstrate that there was in a substantive way substantial comparability in the educational um, programs, facilities, and everything that were offered that the court might permit a, a return to what we have called separate but almost equal. Gretchen, you're shaking your head. You agree with that analysis? Well, I think the VMI decision is very interesting. I think, um, as you know, I represent Professor Mary Daly, who's involved in a, in a conflict with Boston College. The Virginia Military Institute is a public university. It was state-funded throughout its over a century that in existence. And when the Supreme Court looked at what was available to the male citizens of the state of Virginia in a public, publicly funded institution, and what was made available to the female citizens of the state of Virginia at Mary Baldwin College, they did definitely find that there was nothing in terms of the endowment, the reputation, the alumni networks, the rigorousness of the program that would give the women students the same experience that they would have at the state um, institution that existed for men, and that therefore men were, um, women were allowed to, to uh, apply for and, and be admitted to VMI. Now in my case with Boston College, we have a private institution, so those constitutional issues are not at issue in this case. We have and a you also have factually different that you have a co-ed school with separate classes from women. That's right. That's what, what uh, actually what Professor Daly has done for over 20 years in teaching at Boston College, and she's been on the faculty of Boston College for 33 years and is a tenured fa faculty member of, a, of Boston College, which again is a private university, is that she has offered her feminist ethics courses to men and women students in separate sections. She's never refused to teach a male student and in fact, I've spoken with several male students who took her courses over the years and rave about her teaching. Um, but she has always offered her courses to men and women separately since the 1970s. But how do you defend educational segregation? Is it that boys and girls learn differently? Is that they waste too much time showing off for each other when they're in the same classroom? Um, do boys intimidate girls in the educational process? What's the justification? Well, there's a, there's a very good justification in this particular class. 
Professor Daly has always said if she were a Spanish teacher or if she taught mathematics, she would never be talking about separating the, the sexes in her classes. But because she teaches feminist ethics and the purpose of her class is to examine patriarchal institutions. Now there may be disagreement in our society right now about whether patriarchy still exists, whether the feminist movement's work is done, for example. But we know that um, we still live in a society where sexual harassment is extremely common. I think the AUW has been tracking this for a long, long time, and that they're now identifying sexual harassment as a problem for girls in elementary school. Um, so we know that sexual harassment in schools, public schools and private schools, is very, very common, that that affects the dynamic. We know that teachers, even teachers in elementary schools and high schools and colleges who think that they are equally giving opportunities to the male and female students in their classes, and they're consciously trying to do that, they still tend to give more opportunities to the boys in their classes than to the girls. And, yeah, we, also know, and we also know that, that feminist work is not done and that there are fewer and fewer places where women's studies is protected and where, where women's studies is a vigorous um, academic exercise, and Boston College is one of them because they have Mary Daly on the faculty. And so she has found in her 20 years of teaching that she can be most effective for all of her students by teaching this particular subject to male and female students separately. Pam, is separating what? boys from girls appropriate remedy? Or does it reinforce gender stereotypes? I don't know that I think we have enough data out here to say that it has to be all one way or another. As an organization, AAUW has said that we support public education and we support co-ed public education. That it is good teaching methods and awareness from instructors, it is smaller classrooms and strategies used in teaching that make for effective education whether you, whether you are male or female. Now, having said that, we do know uh, then the studies have supported that there certainly is gender stereotyping in the classrooms and different groups get different kinds of attention and get reinforced for different things. Uh, some students are encouraged more to, to look at some academic uh, courses and not at others to pursue some majors and not necessarily other majors. So there is a difference in what, what is happening in the classroom. Um, and I, I think that there is a time and a place where single sex classes may be very appropriate for given individuals and given topics. As the norm, and to go to that across the board, I, I don't know that I think we would support that at all. Let me ask the panel one more question, and then we'll go to the audience. Connie, I, I see you've yeah, got I, a comment I, first. I, I, yeah, I, I wanted to ask. Um, um, Ms. Van Ness, how do you handle the Title IX uh, issue? Because the only time my understanding is that undergraduate institutions are exempted from Title IX is in their overall admissions policy. And once they offer a program, they have to offer the program without sex, without regard right. to sex. Well, that's the other piece of the VMI decision as well, because the, the, the Supreme Court also talked about what Title IX means in, in terms of, um, this is the 1972 uh, law that was enacted to, to provide equal educational opportunity in universities to women students. And Title IX is very interesting because it's, it's, gender, it's a gender neutral statute. So it says that we would provide equal educational opportunities regardless of sex in higher education. But as the law students in the audience might know, um, every statute that is enacted by Congress is interpreted by cases decided by the federal courts and is also applied through regulations that are issued by the, at this point, the Department of Education, called the, and they're in the Code of Federal Regulations. And the Code of Federal Regulations very clearly says that, um, that separate sexes, uh, programs that address sep sexes separately may be appropriate if there's an educational purpose to be served or if there are health and privacy reasons. So that's how we still have male and female locker rooms in, higher, you know, in, in universities and colleges. But there hasn't been a whole lot yet that tests what does it mean if there's a ped good pedagogical reason for separating the sexes. And perhaps Professor Daly's case is going to help sort of flesh out what that really means. Let me ask this question, then we'll go to Mike in the audience. Studies have shown that girls test lower in math and sciences. So some schools have separated the genders for this very reason. Now, does this demean girls by suggesting that girls cannot keep up, they need special handling to, to keep pace with the boys? I think that, from, at least from a constitutional point of view, part of the problem is that in Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court said separate but equal has no place in education. Um, and, and the reason was not just that in that particular circumstances there was no equality, because there wasn't even a, a, an attempt to justify 
um, the the um, uh, Topeka, the, right, the segregation, the Topeka school systems on the basis that we are giving the blacks an equal education to what we're giving the whites. They didn't even try it. The point was, it's the, it's the state-imposed separation in and of itself. You can't have equal if the state says you're being separate. So it doesn't matter what kind of program you're, if, if that's really what Brown meant, and that's what it meant at the time, I think, then I think we have to realize that that's not what it means anymore. If we're going to let separate but equal, then it's really not the problem. It's really not separating the sexes or separating the races that creates the stigma and the, and the inferiority. And, and in fact, there are certain circumstances under which separating the sexes or separating the races are, are good things. And, and if that's the case, then Brown is no longer Brown, and we've moved off of it. And I, I mean, I, I disagree. I think if that's what Brown meant, separate in and of itself brands one group as, as inferior to another, depending on the purpose, then we can't allow it for anything, sex, race, religion, or, or any other reason, but without a compelling my, interest. But, but it's also. But, but the question <laughs> was, why, why don't girls do as well in school, in the secondary school, in math and sciences as, as the boys? Uh, I have Ed here, who has been an educator for a number of years, and he has uh, a strong opinion on that topic. I think uh, one of the panelists uh, had already addressed it, uh, the fact that uh, the, the teachers themselves are not addressing the problem. It's not having the, uh, that girls are less capable, because uh, a lot of the uh, studies have shown that girls are more capable in mathematics at the elementary level. They lose the interest because the people directing the programs, teaching the programs, aren't keeping that interest going. Uh, I think separating them is just going to perpetuate the difference, or uh, uh, the stereotypical difference between male and female. I think addressing the educational process and making people sensitive to gender issues and teaching them how to teach co-ed classes appropriately will provide the need. How do you teach co-ed classes appropriately then? By treating everybody the same. Expe your expectations are the same from everybody as far as the, co the academic is necessary. I'm talking at an elementary high school level. If you get, when you get older, there are choices that uh, can be made, and I have no problem with separation at, at a higher level in a private sector. I have a problem when public money says that one group is different than the other group. Diane, when we come back from the break, we are going to discuss a little more with the audience their own experiences in single-sex high schools and single-sex colleges. Look forward to it. Stay tuned. There you go. Hey. Close the door. I ain't heating the whole city. It's like born in a barn. You know, uh, I talked to your mother. You are gonna be there for dinner on Sunday, right? Three o'clock sharp. Yeah, I see it's empty. This ain't the rich, you know. Dad, why do you keep coming back here? Oh, he's all right. It's just hard for him to be alone, that's all. Well, I gotta get going. You come in? No, I think I'll stick around a bit. See you Sunday. All right, babe. I'm buying. Maybe the last thing you would do for somebody should be the first. You know I never drink my own stuff. I'm taking a pretty big chance in myself. <laughs> a message from the Credit Union Foundation in your hometown Credit Union. Today's the day you can decide what kind of life your kids and their kids will have. If we don't do something about global warming, global warming will surely do something about them. Before long, America's heartland might have to live with temperatures over 90 degrees for almost a third of each year. Chicago now has two weeks a year over 90 degrees. In just 60 years, it could expect two months each year. If the weather in Dallas could go over 100 degrees for two and a half months, imagine what could happen in Phoenix. If you think global warming is only about warmer temperatures, it's only the beginning. In our kids' lifetimes, drinking water could be a problem as salty ocean water backs into our rivers. America's heartland could have trouble growing the corn, wheat, and oats that we need for bread and cereal. Every man, woman, and child can help make a difference, and that includes you. The Sierra Club can show you how. Find out today. Your children, your grandchildren are counting on you. 
Diane, first a disclaimer. I, I am a product of a boys only high school, and that may. Uh, I try not that... to hold that against you too much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm standing here with Charity and Joanna, who are both uh, products of female only colleges and have very strong opinions with respect to that as well. Charity? Hi. I went to a females only college by choice, and I found it to be a very good experience. I chose to go there. I believe that there could be gender uh, separate schools that are healthy for people to learn in. It was a great experience and I'm happy I did it. Joanna? I, I had a similar experience. I too chose um, to go to college at a single sex institution and I had a great experience there. It doesn't mean that I don't like men or that I don't get along with men. <laughs> I experienced a great community. There was a lot of bonding and camaraderie and we talked about issues we never could have talked about otherwise and I've, I've look back on that experience with such gratitude. Um, I, we studied anything we wanted to. There was no discrimination. There was no, there was no fear of any you know, backlash. If we were smart, we weren't going to get a date. There was none of that. It was total freedom for, for women. And I, I really appreciated that experience. If I could follow up on that, all the studies actually have shown that graduates of women's colleges succeed in their chosen fields at a greater rate than graduates of co-ed colleges. And if you look at the boards of directors of the Fortune 500 company, predominantly the women who are on those boards are graduates of women's colleges. So we actually are seeing that that women-only space, the chance for women to succeed without those, ex those outside um, you know, pressures of the society are actually very, very powerful institutions and very, very powerful spaces. And I'm glad to hear from both of the members of the audience about that. I, I want to provide another side. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not for everyone, but it's not first, for everyone. For, for, yeah. First of all, my understanding is that when those, those studies are uh, um, fixed for the seven sister schools, which attract an exceptionally high um, uh, caliber of student, that in fact there is virtually no difference between women who succeed who are graduates of co-ed institutions and women who succeed who are graduates of women-only institutions. Um, I went to a women's only institution. I went to a women's only institution for two years and hated every minute of it and transferred to a school, a ma predominantly male school, actually it was an all-male school that had just gone co-ed. Uh, I found the educational experience far superior. Um, uh, Why, Connie? Because I found the men were questioners and the women were not. I found the women were not encouraged to think cr creatively and did not think creatively. They were not encouraged to ask questions. They were not encouraged um, to do a lot of things. And this was many years ago. I also, quite frankly, the school treated us as if we were children. Uh, we had limited number of overnights. We weren't allowed to have men in the dorms. We couldn't have cars. Um, uh, it, it was it was a miserable experience. It was also during the Vietnam. It was also during the Vietnam War when um, part the part of the school that I was in um, was not interested in in allowing any of the women to recognize that there was a major social issue occurring um, because they were too worried about whether we were going to classes or not. And it was very different at the men's school. They treated you like an adult, like you were allowed to have some responsibility for yourself. Um, and, and handle yourself as an adult. And I know that things have changed, um, and I think that it may have been a product of the time, and that was that I went to college at a point when Dartmouth and Amherst and Williams and Yale and Princeton were all going co-ed, and the women who were at the Seven Sisters schools, we really just wanted to be at those men's colleges, and most of us ended up there. But um, my experience is exactly the opposite. As Connie was talking, I had two people moaning quite loudly back here. <laughs> so it, I know I could hardly hear what you were saying. <laughs> um, it's, it's, My it's, experience was totally different from that. I was encouraged to be creative and to think. And at the time I went, women were housewives. They weren't encouraged to be anything but nurses or teachers. And our experience was to make ourselves role model. Men and women are different. And you cannot stand up and say, I want equal rights and expect it to happen. We have had, since I've been to college, which is 30 years ago, I've tried to be a role model to the people that I deal with in, in different women's groups, like Girl Scouting, um, like in my school department, just to make young women think that you can be creative. And I think we each have to do it individually because no law is going to make a change. We have to. What about the philosophy that, that if you're, and I knew at that time that I was going to be competing in a male world because I decided I was going to be an attorney. And so I figured, you know what, the longer I stay in a room full of women where there aren't any men, the harder it's going to be for me to get out there and compete. I want to be able to do it now 
and I want to learn in, a, in a, an environment, in a laboratory where the stakes are not, not going to be as high. In my law school class, they were, I went to Boston College in 1985, there were half men and half women admitted to that class. Every single woman who was at the top of the class was a graduate of a women's college, including me. And I was editor-in-chief of Law Review, and I've competed very well, I'd say, uh, in my career. Yeah. we got to go back. Some people argue that co-ed education reflects the values, the perspectives, and the practices of a dominant male culture. And thus, curriculum, pedagogy, and activities really favor men participating in the classroom and not women. I'd like to ask Mike to ask the audience, do you agree generally with that proposition? Uh, yes, hold on. <laughs> I agree. I've seen it in the past 28 years of teaching. I've seen the end result of it. As I said before, the younger girls excited about science and math at the lower grades and slowly turned off. That's wrong. It has to change. That doesn't mean we separate them and accept that kind of philosophy of education. We change the way we teach. We change the way so that both sides can benefit from the diversity in the classroom and not separate them and perpetuate or have us go back to the idea that women have one role in the world and men have another. Diane, as you and I have spoken about in the past as well, it's not indicative of uh, how well females do at this law school either. They generally do quite well, at least as well as mo most of the men. Um, someone else has a comment. Uh, hold on, let me get to Bill first and then I'll come up. I, I just think we're looking at the wrong issue. Uh, we're, the assumption that the woman comes to school without power, without creativity, and without the strength to do very well in society is fallacious. They come to school very well, very well uh, endowed with the intellectual and emotional qualities to do well. It's the school and the culture that teaches them not to do so. And I think rather than us talk about what it is that we can do legally or non legally we might want to be talking a lot more about what those teachers and those parents and everybody in this room says to men to women about what they can do i have a daughter i have a wife and i have friends that are women and i sure don't want them getting the message that i hear them getting from schools and from a lot of people now that they're second rate and should then be put in separate schools so they can be strong i don't want that to be the basis when I got out of college, I worked in an industry that was entirely dominated by men. There were very few women. And I really feel like if I didn't go to a co-ed school, I would have been highly disadvantaged by the fact that I never learned how to interact with men in a competitive environment. And I have one more quick question for the panelists who said that these women who made the uh, board of directors or our CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies, I wonder, does that have something to do with the separation in education? Or does that have something to do with the fact that these all-women schools hap happen to be some top-notch schools? And if you looked at the same board of directors and CEOs, wouldn't the men have come from top-notch schools as well, and not some of the local, more state schools. There's a researcher by the name of Elizabeth Tidball who's been studying women in higher education for a good 20 or 30 years now, tracking all of this information. She has a new book out that, again, reinforces that women who have the chance to have a woman-only experience in education tend to succeed um, in, a, in a greater way. Um, but, the, but it's so interesting because what I find representing Mary Daly is that at Boston College, she offers one class, her Introduction to Feminist Ethics class, each semester that she's on campus. It's one class where the men and women are separated. And everyone talks about that as if, oh my god, this is going to be a horrible disadvantage. We live in a co-ed world. Every woman in this classroom knows how to talk to men, knows how to interact with men. In fact, women have to know better than men how to interact with men. Men don't have to figure out how to interact with women because men get to do what they want to do. So every woman here is shaking, every woman here is shaking their head. You know what I'm saying. We know how, we know this world. And it's not as if that for one minute we get a chance to talk to each other. You know, how many parties have you been to where the cool discussion's going on in the kitchen where all the women are? <laughs> Pam, you're dying to say something. <laughs> I think times have certainly changed. I, now I went to a state co-ed school. I had some of the same restrictions that you were talking about. But that, I think, just dates me more than anything else uh, <laughs> in, in, in terms of years. But I think a number of things have changed in society in terms of our seeing women who are, who are reaching higher plateaus, who are moving into careers that they have not typically uh, felt were necessarily open to them. Uh, for a whole variety of reasons. The opportunities to attend schools uh, that you felt more comfortable in, that gave you greater opportunities for growth and development was part of it. 
the fact that we've been able to, to uh, compete in competitive sports has also played into that in terms of learning how to play the game and be competitive and still actually be able to speak to people when it's all said and done. The reality is while we've seen changes in our classroom, we still have some significant difference it's in the way individuals both as students and as teachers approach the classroom in how we interact with students, in whom we expect to do well, whom we don't expect to do well, whom we give the second opportunity to, whom we ask the probing deductive follow-up questions to and whom we take whatever the answer is and say that's nice and move right along, be it male or female. Uh, we are seeing changes in the number of women who are, who are taking high school courses uh, throughout the hard sciences. They're still reluctant to get themselves into physics and AP physics. Chemistry and bio are another story. They're taking more math. They're not taking as much in technology. We're doing more data processing than we are in terms of design and programming. There have been changes, but we're not there yet. And much of it goes to what society tells us our roles are supposed to be and what role models we have in front of us and what the interaction between student and teacher is in the classroom. Can I just need to respond. My, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Tidball study. My understanding is that, that there have been several studies since, I'm not sure about the new one, but since her, her earlier one, um, which have um, uh, basically debunked her, her, her previous uh, conclusion. Um, and, and so I, I'm not so sure that, that there really is any empirical evidence. I think it's what Pam said a long time at the beginning. There really isn't any evidence that women do any better in separate situations under any circumstance. It's unfortunate, but we're out of time. I'm going to leave you with this question. Who should accommodate who? Should women accommodate the institutions? Should the institutions accommodate women? Thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you on the next MSL Presents, A Question of Law. Thanks so much. Wherever you go, you see the signs. A new century is coming, and with it, a thousand questions. Will there be peace? Will your family ever be in harm's way? Will a small town in Texas be hit with a hurricane? Will your daughter ever need a new kind of blood treatment? Will that nice man who hands you the paper ever need a hand to hold in a time of need? We have no crystal ball for the world that awaits. Just one promise. We'll be there. Whether it's in the eye of the storm, in your darkest hour, in your time of need, or in the light of day, We'll be there. A baby changes everything. What you buy, how you do your taxes, the way you drive your car, everything. And while change is good, usually, you can always use help. And with more than 200 free and low-cost federal booklets, the free consumer information catalog can help. Call toll-free 1-888-8-Pueblo, even if you don't have a baby.